On behalf of all the faculty and staff and all of us that make our living here at Country Dad, I want to welcome you all. And I'm here to tell you, we're in for a treat. We are absolutely in for a treat. Parker Schenecker, who will be introduced here in a moment, um, I was able to talk him into coming onto campus today around noon, and he taught two classes in uh, uh, extraordinary, a very complex, wonderful person, and he is a treasure. I was going to say a treasure to Fort Worth Country Day, or a treasure to Fort Worth, or a treasure to Tampa, or a treasure to the folks that live in Germany, and those folks who are toiling away in Afghanistan, or toiling away in Kuwait, or soldiers in Fort Hood, or soldiers at Fort Huachuca, but he's, he's a national treasure, and I think that, uh, that you're, in, you're in for a, a wonderful time tonight. We have a great evening planned, as we always do. This is our 10th annual Chip Hearn Memorial Lecture, and we'll begin with a lecture here in the theater followed by a, a reception uh, in the Martin Campus Center. We'll also lay a wreath uh, at our Veterans Garden, which is uh, right behind this building afterward. I do want to say that we have some very special guests tonight. Kelly uh, Schinnaker, Parker's uh, wonderful wife, is here tonight, as is Sally Hollenbeck, Chip's sister. She's here from Cypress, Texas. And then, of course, we are blessed. We missed you last year. We're so happy to have Chip's mother, Connie Herr, join us from Vero Beach, Florida. And if you don't have the opportunity or hadn't had the opportunity uh, to visit with Connie and Sally, uh, please do. We're also blessed to have Nancy Schinnaker with us. Nancy, welcome back to Fort Worth Country Day. <laughs> Nancy made her way here from uh, New Orleans and uh, and when she, she, I got a chance to visit with Nancy earlier when they, when they dropped Parker off. And uh, Parker, I how old are you? Uh, are you 55 or something? 56. Na Nancy, the look on Nancy's face, it looked almost like she was dropping him off at his first Little League game. <laughs> really? I guess we never stopped being so proud of our children. Anyway, it was wonderful. It was priceless. I'm going to put my glasses on. A few weeks back, I was reading a letter that I received from Connie Hurd, and it was dated September 21st, 2014. And in that letter, she wrote, Dear Bill, it was a long letter. I'll read part of it. It said, Dear Bill, it says, Where do I begin to thank you for the wonderful evening at Country Day? Country Day has given my son eternal life, and for that I shall always be grateful. Every year I expect to hear that the lecture series will be no more. Every year I expect that the lecture series will be no more. First of all, I'd like to say I have absolutely no intention of stopping this lecture, Connie. It was established to pay tribute to a proud alum, the son of a revered faculty member, and to an American patriot. It was also established to memorialize a man who embodied the school's purpose statement, that being to inspire the passion to learn, the courage to lead, and the commitment to serve. Chip's lecture has now become a very important part of the history of Country Day. In fact, over the last several years, we've shared many wonderful memories together. Can I see a show of hands of those of you who have been to every Chip Her lecture? Yeah, I see so many of you come every year. That first year we established it, we hosted two speakers, Pete Guerin and Gordon England. As secretaries of the Army and the Navy, they spoke to the challenges faced by our nation at that time. The next year, we hosted Tom Schieffer, ambassador to Japan. And since then, we have heard from a college president, a world record endurance athlete, a former Dallas Cowboy grade, a renowned American historian and biographer from the University of Texas, and even a National Geographic explorer. And last year, Dr. Kerry Currier enlightened us 
about the continued threats posed by North Korea. Lectures like these are very important. Not only do they help us build a better understanding of a confusing world, but they also help us to build the fabric of Country Day as an ac academic institution of significance. Like CHIP, this lecture series has become a very important part of our history. And it should not come as a surprise to anyone that history is very important to me. Among other things, history builds empathy. It reminds us that everyone, everyone has a backstory. It reminds us that we all have strength and weaknesses. We're all human. It reminds us that we all want to be treated with kindness and respect. And it also reminds us that none of us is self-made. All of us stand on the shoulders of others. And we have all been blessed by people we've never known. I believe Daniel Borston, the former Library of Congress, was correct when he said that trying to plan for the future without a sense of the past is like trying to plant cut flowers. <laughs> now, I suspect some of you are wondering why you got an index card. I'll tell you briefly. And, it, and it's a, a result of the fact that in preparation for tonight's lecture, I watched every video and read every note from our past nine speakers. And what struck me, the common theme from all of those speakers is the wisdom that they've put forth. Pete Guerin and Gordon England warned us that the greatest threat to the United States was national debt and the growing threat of cyber attacks on our election system. Jennifer Farr Davis implored us to please go outside, get some exercise, and for good sakes, protect our natural resources. Dr. Bill Brands from the University of Texas explained that real stories are far more exciting than fiction, and we can improve our own lives by paying attention to the stories of the past. Dr. Chris Howard, president of Hampton Sydney College, shared the importance of leadership instruction for young people and why freedom of expression at America's universities is vital to American democracy. Andres Russo proved to us that the world is worth exploring. And just when we think we know it all, we don't. And last year, Dr. Kerry Currier helped us understand the complexity of U.S.-North Korea relations by sharing her insights into the mind of North Korean policymakers. I want you to think for a moment what would have happened if we had departed this lecture hall every year, armed with new and exciting information and taken action. I'm fearful, just a little fearful, that you may walk out tonight and not remember all of Parker's wise words. We can't afford that. We need to remember what Parker says. We need to remember it regardless how old we are or how young we are. We all need reminding. And now you have a note card to write on. I'm honored right now to introduce William Burnett. William currently serves as the student body president here at Fort Worth Country Day. He's a fine representative of what we love about our Country Day students. He is interesting. He plans to study business or physics in college. He hopes to attend either Georgetown University, the University of Texas, or Yale. His other interests are tennis, graphic design, and he loves fantasy football. William, come on up. Tonight I have the honor of introducing Colonel Parker Schinnaker. Colonel Parker Schinnaker was a senior leader and strategist in the United States intelligence community responsible for, for support of the U.S. and allied defense and counterterrorism efforts throughout the Middle East and the Horn of Africa. He finished his 31-year career at the United States Central Command in Tampa, Florida, with combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and over 20 deployments to the Middle East and Africa. He has had the great fortune to work with and lead the best people America has to offer individuals who swear an oath 
to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and volunteer to put their lives on hold and put themselves at risk in defense of our way of life. His unique story of service, honor, and resilience is inspiring. After 30 plus years of government service, this great leader, role model, and dad has chosen to continue his service to society by focusing his efforts on youth character development and scholarship. Please help me welcome Colonel Parker Schinniger. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. President. First time I've ever been able to say that. Um, it's nice to know that there are some uh, some wonderful folks following her footsteps. I didn't get the chance to introduce a, a chipper lecturer, but uh, held your post not so well when I was here. I'm sure you're doing a much better job than I did. Um, wow, 40 years since I've been on this stage. I'm not going to call the folks who were on the stage with me at that time up, and I'm sure we could uh, we could crack into a few renditions of Luck Be a Lady or <laughs> something from uh, the, the Royal Canadian Mountie deal, Little Mary Sunshine. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, your presence and your time is the most precious gift you can give to anyone. And so you honor me at the low part of the totem pole, but you honor Connie and Sarah and the, her family and my buddy Chip by spending your time with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Lombardi, Mr. Arnold, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I would have dropped everything that I had to be here, so thank you very much. We're going to talk about some serious issues tonight. We're also going to have a little bit of fun. Most importantly, we're going to talk about my buddy Chip Hart which we normally don't get to do in depth at the HER lecture because all, of all those, those wonderful speakers that, that Bill mentioned, and I, I think I've only missed one, so I didn't get to raise my hand. None of those speakers really got to give some insight on Chip. Well, I get that honor, and it's a pretty cool one. So if you will indulge me, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about various topics, but most importantly, my buddy Chip. So it's a great honor to be here amongst like-minded people who are committed to something bigger than themselves. And I know you're thinking, those of you who don't know me, you're thinking, great, Mr. Arnold. You invited some retired army colonel, who cares? <laughs> Probably a bunch of war stories from some foul-mouthed soldier. Well, part of that's true. <laughs> I've been asked to address the topic of resilience and to talk about my buddy Chip. And for me, an effective way to rebound from adversity or tragedy is to swear in public. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> but it might not be what you expect. So before you start running for the doors and before you start covering your ears and pulling out your phones, it is G-rated <laughs> and kind of gave me the green light to give this lecture. <laughs> I have been vetted. Now look, while swearing in public is a bit tongue-in-cheek, I get it. I promise you that it's appropriate when discussing resiliency. If you'll bear with me, I'll introduce you to a few situations in which choices were made in the face of extreme misfortune. I, Parker Schenecker, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. How'd I do? Right on. This is the oath that most service members who serve you takes. And other than the Pledge of Allegiance, which we used to be able to say in schools, my military oath was the first time I remember swearing in public. This swearing in public meant that I would promise to lay down my life 
in defense of our country and all we hold dear. I swore this oath on the 31st of May, 1984, as I was accepting my commission in the United States Army as a second lieutenant in the Intelligence Corps. I made this promise without any hesitation. But whether you use the words promise, commit, or my favorite words, the swear words, you're binding yourself by an oath, much like that oath that I took back in 1984. And sometimes it's hard to swear in public. I mean, we're taught not to. How many of you are still working off putting money in your swear jar at your house every time you popped off? Nancy's living a really comfortable life now <laughs> because of Edmund. <laughs> my brother for those of you who don't know and if you knew Edmund you'd laugh well while swearing in public is hard to do I'm going to encourage you to do so I'm going to encourage you to do so often and I'm going to encourage you to do so loudly and proudly you know a leader once said it well the truth of the matter is you always know the right thing to do the hard Heart is doing it. This was a quote from General Norman Schwarzkopf, who was a four-star Army commander, who was Chips and my senior commander in Iraq um, at the time of the first Gulf War. Since deceased, highly revered in both military and civilian leadership channels. <clears throat> so doing the hard thing. I spent 31 years in service to our country in various command and staff positions. 15 years of that was overseas, including combat tours. My family lived in 14 duty stations. My children attended 12 different schools. But you know, that's the life of military family. Let me introduce you to one of my best buds, Garth Callahan. And in this photo to his left is his daughter, Emma. This picture was taken of Garth and Emma, about eighth grade for her, I believe, if that's right. Emma is also my goddaughter. So Garth, talk about a world-class dad. He relished the opportunity to raise a strong, independent young lady. He wanted to communicate with Emma at every chance he had, but he realized she was going to school for part of the day as well. But at an early age, Garth decided that he was gonna communicate Emma in quite a bit different way than maybe some parents do. And as he was making her lunch every morning, he would write a handwritten note on a napkin and he would slide it in her lunchbox. Because his sole desire was to raise a strong, independent young lady even if he wasn't there to physically communicate with her on a daily basis. He wanted her to know that he had her back. Now, you know, you may think that's a really sweet gesture from a classy guy, but I gotta tell you, as a dad, our, our love just overflows and is overabundant, if that's actually a word, um, at times. And it may have resulted in Garth kind of overshooting the target every now and then, Remember that guy who quit? Well, nobody else does either, right? So Emma's a third grader. <laughs> contemplating the existential issues of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Oh yeah, and go Raiders on the side. She's a softball player. You know, I guess my buddy could be overzealous at times, showing his love, but guess what? That's a dad's prerogative. Told you she was a softball player. Some of them were sports themed. Yesterday's home runs don't win today's games. Babe Ruth, I like that one. Talking about history, everyone's got a story. Focus on history, but don't let it drag you down. But you learn from it. Emma's a softball player, so some of those notes are sports themed, but friends didn't really know about the napkins as much, but they would always hear Garth say, Emma, I love to watch you play. 
And for those of you who might have had the honor of knowing my father, you know that my father said that to each one of you, as well as my brother and me. And he would say to me, Sonny man, I love to watch you play. Unfortunately, Garth would get some news that would forever change his world as he knew it. Garth was diagnosed with kidney cancer multiple times, prostate cancer, and brain cancer on top of that. This is a CT scan of Garth's body showing the progression of his early kidney cancer. You see, Garth looked healthy. Garth acted healthy. But Garth wasn't healthy. But he would always choose the most aggressive treatment. These two photos were taken a mere 46 days apart. The doctor would inform him, inform him that he had an 8% chance to live past five years. But you see, while the medicine and the treatment would take a toll on Garth and ravage his body, that same treatment would never even come close, close to touching his soul or his spirit. So even in the face of his own mortality, Garth knew exactly what he had to do. He worried about his family and wondered about how, how they were gonna deal with him not being around. But through all of that noise, Garth quieted himself and knew exactly what he had to do. And what did he do? Hey, he swore in public. He would promise to write 826 napkin notes, one for every day of school that Emma had left until she graduated from high school. And he put them in a lockbox because he wanted to make sure that he still communicated with his daughter, even if he wasn't there physically to tell her that he loved her and he supported her. Ever wonder what a father's love looks like? I mean, I've felt it. My dad was a bear of a man, six foot, put another hundred pounds on me, <laughs> big old bear hug, he'd squeeze the air right out of me. But you loved it. So I've felt a dad's love. You ever seen a dad's love poured out in 826 napkin notes? One for every day that you have left till you graduate from high school? Dear Emma, sometimes when I need a miracle, I look into your eyes and I realize I've already created one. Love that. You see, Garth had a choice to make. His circumstances were dire. His prognosis was bleak. He had every right to be angry, resentful, and hateful. Or he could choose to be grateful for all that he did have, all that he had to live for, and swear in public to help him drive his gratitude engine. But you see, Garth's story really isn't being a, a dad, about being a dad. It's not about a dad's love. It's about doing something impactful with what you have. Bill, it's what I talked about today in one of the classrooms. It's about living your legacy, not leaving your legacy. Live it now. Don't leave it to epitaphs. Don't leave it to epilogues. And don't leave it to headstones. You have a choice to make. This is Emma Callahan, Garth and Lisa, Ca Lisa Callahan's daughter, my goddaughter, and a Johnson Scholar at Washington Lee University. Mission accomplished. So let's shift gears now. And let's talk about something I really want to talk about tonight. That gap in Chip's teeth. <laughs> Sorry. 
Hey, I had one too, Connie. Sorry. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with my buddy, let me introduce you to Captain David R. Herr, Jr., United States Marine Corps. Family knew him as Chip. I called him Dave or Buddy. We know about Chip's service to our nation, but let me give you a little insight on what got him there. The first picture on the left, I think maybe is Chip in fourth grade, but even if it's not, think about Chip in fourth grade at Fort Worth Country Day School. A new student, off the charts, extremely bright. No idea why he hung around with me. <laughs> Funny and well-grounded. Most importantly to me, a loyal friend. In the middle, Chip at Washington Lee University, our alma mater in Lexington, Virginia. Still exceedingly bright, focused and immersed in the WNL culture. But most importantly to me, a loyal friend. Captain Herb as United States Marine, hoorah. Resolute, committed leader, expert marine aviator, focused on the present and the future. Most importantly to me, a loyal friend. Some ask, why would a guy with a country day background and a W note background why would he want to join the Marines? He had so much going for him. Honey, I know you've heard that before. Mom, I know you've heard that about me. Very interesting comments about folks that maybe just don't get it. The answer to that question is simple. It only takes a dive into Chip's foundation. Fort Worth Country Day School, although in sixth grade, being taught by the headmaster of the school, Pete Schwartz, as my Latin teacher, it was the first recorded F. <laughs> I think that's five, or that's Greek, sorry. I would like to say in the, in the history of the Schenekers in school, but I know that's not true. <laughs> My dad got kicked out of more schools than he went to. <laughs> First F I ever got in my academic career was in Latin in sixth grade. And the only Latin words I remember today, humanitas per disciplinum. Why? The motto of this school. Written into, if, if you know the logo, written into the old, the old logo on our signet graduation rings. Humanity through discipline. These traits, these, these morals, these character traits and principles that are listed underneath Country Day are from the school's documents. Integrity, courage, respect, responsibility. And this institution was started in 1963. Not so bad, 50 something years. I wasn't a math major, I was a French major. Right. <laughs> to take my shoes off to count that high. 50 something years. So let's matriculate to Washington and Lee. Non incautus futuri. Be not unmindful of the future. Know your history, but focus on the future. Honor, integrity, and civility. 1749, one of the oldest academic institutions in the United States of America. And then to Chip's beloved core, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. I never shorten it, could say Semper Fi. Always faithful. Honor, courage, and commitment. Honor, courage, and commitment 24 7, 365. That institution was started in 1775. Chip's roots run deep. the epitome of the selfless servant. Actually, the epitome of the Renaissance man. His roots run deep. But that foundation isn't the schools. 
Chip's foundation came from his household in a loving family. He was raised in a loving but demanding family. And those of you who know Connie know the deal. She told me to stand up straight tonight. I'm doing it. They demanded that he be a good person, a good neighbor, an outstanding student, and a loyal friend. Get that wrong and it's an uphill battle in life. But Dr. and Mrs. Hurd provided the foundation for both Chip and Sarah to become something special. Chip's journey outside that household met this progression. If I might digress a bit, I'm gonna tell you a little story here. I'm gonna to have to look down at my notes because I wanna make sure I get it right um, because it, uh, it was communicated in a very, very special way uh, and I have to make sure that I get, uh, get all the details right. Just one forward, please. Thank you. It was Chip's senior year. The baseball team, of which I was a member, played third base, had won no games. <laughs> Only losing season I ever had in any of my, in my history of playing sports. And I played college ball, I played semi-pro ball, only losing season ever in any sport. Chip went to Coach Minerly, who was also head of the upper school at the time, and said he always wanted to pitch a game. He played right field, usually. Had a pretty good arm. Pretty, pretty rangy, pretty gamey. Tough, tough baseball player. And even though starter Brad Tribble, who's in the audience tonight, was an effective pitcher and was our starter, he was our guy. Big old strong pitcher. The ball was halfway to the home plate by the time he came off the mound. It was awesome. There really was no depth in the rotation. Brad will tell you he got tired of not having any backup. Well, Mr. Mimley told Dave, Dave that he could pitch against Jesuit on April 3rd, 1980. You see, Chip played Little League. I never played with I played Little League, but didn't play with Chip. And as a 10-year-old, he was chosen to move up to the majors with this friend of his named Burton Parnell. I knew Burton and Chris Lowry. I didn't know Chris so well. Is Burton here? Okay, Chris here? Yeah, I was gonna shame him. <laughs> as soon as they were selected though, as happenstance, Chris, Chris's father got a new job and they moved to Dallas. So Chris moved as well. Okay, so April 3 comes along. And the bus takes all of us over to Dallas to play this game. And we're going to go, we're going to go, he's going to, Dave's going to pitch against Jesuit. We go to show up. When it arrives, the sidelines are, are loaded with college scouts, with talent scouts. I mean, completely loaded. Because the opposing pitcher had a 16 game winning streak. <laughs> that opposing pitcher's name was Chris Lowry. The guy Chip had played Little League with, mm -hmm. and it just moved to Dallas. So the Hers were at home getting ready for dinner when my dad, Eddie Schenker, the original super fan, <laughs> called and said, Connie, your son has the slowest, most accurate pitch in the history of baseball. <laughs> and he just won us the game one to nothing. The opposition just couldn't figure out how to hit his slow ball. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out, and I watched it happen myself. The hardest thing of doing some of these things, Connie, is you know just all the archives and whoever pulled out those still photos of guys and dolls and posted them on Facebook the other day. Thank you. <laughs> but the hard thing is some of finding some of the archival footage that we need to, to, to do these things justice. Well, I mean, I have some extensive intelligence background and I have some ex extensive uh, resources at my disposal. So I actually was able to find uh, video from that game. And I'd love to say that it was out at the, at the Ranger Stadium. Remember that day, Brad, we were out there playing? It was, it was such a great day. I think that was a highlight of all of our careers. 
Being up on that mound, pitching, right, Brad? Yep. It was awesome. It was a great play to doubleheader. I just stayed out there for three or four of them. It was awesome. But uh, but I do have video of that day, so just I mean just make sure that you're you're ready for this. <laughs> Can you run it, please? Hey, I think I'll put Plexi with my slow ball. <laughs> And that's even Jesuit blue. <laughs> so what does that teach me? That lesson, that lesson that Chip taught me about, that taught me about tenacity. If there's one thing I can say about Chip, when it came to sport, he had a tenaciousness that was unrivaled. A little shorter in <coughs> physical stature. Phenomenal physical presence. Really neat. Never underestimate Chipper. That was my takeaway that day. So we're schoolmates, classmates and good friends from fourth grade, not only through high school here, but we both went on to w &L. We both chose to serve. I'm on the left on the top photo up there in the old army green uniform ugly. Dave's in the whites, the marine uniform. They got it right. This photo was taken on the 31st of May, 1984, that day that we swore our oaths, those first public swearings that we did. And to the right of that was my brother, who was there a year ahead of me. So a quick side note, on commissioning day, on this day, where Chip and I would both go from being cadets or officer candidates to actually being lieutenants in our respective services. We were in separate ceremonies. The Marines commissioned earlier than, than the Army did. I think Chip's commissioning was at nine, ours was at 10. I purposely snuck around campus hiding behind trees, behind the columns and the colonnade and so forth. So I didn't have to see Lieutenant Chip Hurd. Because you see, I was still an ROTC cadet until I, I pinned on my lieutenant bars. And as a soldier, there was no way I was delivering a salute to a Marine lieutenant in his body. <laughs> it just wasn't gonna happen. So instead of doing the right thing, swallowing my pride, and finding Chip, and proudly sticking my chest out and saluting him, I decided to take the other way around. A few years later, Chip, a Marine Corps aviator, would lay down his life for us in Operation Desert Shield. And the interesting thing about that vignette I just told you was the first time that I ever did salute Chip was as I was honoring him as we put him to, laid him to rest in Greenwood. How did I handle losing one of my best friends? So young. How did I get through the survivor's guilt that I somehow had that a friend of mine had died instead of me? It's an interesting dynamic. Well, I swore in public, again, because this is what I did. And I asked his mother for one of Chip's captain's bars, and I put that captain's bar on my, near, on my dog tags, and I wore that with my dog tags in front of my heart for the remainder of my 27 years in service to honor chip service. And on my retirement, amidst the wave of tears and words I'm sure they're unintelligible, <laughs> I removed chips, captain's bar from my dog tags 
and I retired his captain's bar as I retired. And I returned that captain's bar to Connie and Sarah. They were at the ceremony. Connie's wearing that captain's bar tonight. Thank you for that honor. Now, while everyone's subject to tragedy in their lives, folks in this audience who've suffered greater, way greater tragedies than I ever have, there's this kind of inherent overlap between a soldier's life and, and the dangerous world we live in. We call it breaking, breaking stuff and setting it on fire. I mean, that's what I did for a living for 30 years. There's kind of this close connection between a service member's life and tragedy. There's this overlap that's somehow inevitable. But I chose gratitude over hate. Even suffering survivor's guilt, and I made the choice, and I made that promise. So I mentioned earlier about my three decades of service and how moving every two years or so was just kind of part of the, way, the Army life. Well, also being part of the military is having a regulation for everything you do. It's from, it governs every aspect of your life from what you wear and how you wear it, how your hair <laughs> looks. That's a long story. How to march in formation, nine inches to the front, six inches to the rear, how to trim your hair. But one regulation in particular would change my life. And you're looking at it. It's Army Regulation 600-8-1, the Army Casualty Program. It's 55 pages long. I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. Spark Notes now? Oh, y'all don't use those here, I understand. I'll read everything. <laughs> read all of Animal Farm, it's awesome, by the way. <laughs> I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. At least two uniformed service members in dress uniforms, like Chip and I were wearing in that photo, in dress uniforms, one soldier of equal rank and one chaplain go to a family's location where they live, uh, home of record, and notify a family in person of a soldier's grave illness, injury, or death. No one ever wants to see those uniform members at the front door. But it's a time-honored tradition, right, Dan? It's a time-honored tradition that we don't break ranks from. We want to make sure that family members are honored. We want to make sure that service members and their service is honored. And the last thing we want to have happen is a family member to be notified through the rumor channels and worse even that, get the wrong information. That something has happened, but it actually hasn't, or something's worse than it actually is. It's a very scripted process. So when sitting at my desk in the country of Gutter, the 28th of January, 2011, it was 9.57 p.m. It had been an extraordinarily hot day in Gutter, just like every other day in Gutter. And I was sitting at a desk at 9.57 because I had a secure, secure video teleconference with my leadership back in Tampa at 10 p.m. cutter time. And I was kind of going through things. I had just come back from Afghanistan, a quick deployment there to check out our troops, talk to the ambassador, talk to the leaders who were there. And I was going to report out to my boss. And I, I looked up from my desk and I, and I saw two uh, um, individuals kind of entering the, entering the door in the office. One army colonel in fatigues, in camouflage uniform, sweaty, dirty, you know, had been out in the, in the elements. And this Air Force captain, same thing, camouflage, kind of dirty, sweaty. I thought they were in, you know, talk about need, some needs that they had for the, the mission next day. So we were going to crank something up for them. But I, I happened in that split second, I looked right in that colonel's eyes, and he caught my gaze. And I knew that he was getting to deliver some pretty bad news to me. For you see, I had been the deliverer of news like this before. It's no job anyone ever wants. But it's an honor duty that we carry out. 
I put two and two together and I thought, oh my gosh, something's happened to mom back in Louisiana. Well, I was wrong. An almost unimaginable headline out of Tampa, Florida. A mother is under arrest accused of carefully planning and killing her teenage children. Many are asking how and why a mother could do this to her own children. Police say mother, Julie Shaniker, first shot her 13-year-old son, Bo, at point-blank range in the family car on the way back from soccer practice. She then came home and allegedly shot her 16-year-old daughter, Calix, while she was sitting in front of her computer doing her homework. One was shot from behind, one was shot from the side. We don't believe that the children knew that their mother meant to harm them. Shaniker is the wife of an Army intelligence officer based at CENTCOM headquarters at MacDill Air Force Base. Army officials say her husband was overseas when the shooting took place. Army officials say that her husband was overseas at the time the shooting took place. You know exactly where I was at 9.57 p.m. when I was informed that my children were killed at the hands of their mother. And me, a tough guy, a bad man in jam in combat uniform, I could do nothing about it. What would you do? Well, here's what I did, right or wrong. I spent the next 17 hours on a plane by myself, flying from Doha gutter back to Tampa, trying to figure out how I was gonna live my life. Was, why, was life even worth living without my calyx and my bow? And when I returned to Tampa and I began the process of trying to put this all together and try to understand I not only had the responsibility to get myself through this, but my family, my military family, my friends, an entire Tampa Bay community. I had to deal with the media, and the media's sole focus was the horrific circumstances in which my children died. The media didn't want to talk about how my children lived. They only wanted to talk about how my children died. We dealt with an entourage from the Westboro Baptist Church who decided to protest outside my children's memorial service that their friends were putting on for them. That was special. But through all of that, through all of that noise, the drumbeat in my head was that Calix and Bo needed to be remembered and remembered for the lives that they lived, not for the lives that we lost. For not only did I have to get myself through this horrible tragedy, the most unthinkable tragedies. You know, it wasn't supposed to happen. Not to me. But you see, Caleb and Bo were still alive in the hearts and minds of their friends. And I would do my best to sustain that life. So what did I do? I swore in public, again, this time in the most public of circumstances, live in front of an international TV audience tuned in to their memorial service here in Fort Worth. Today, we celebrate the way they lived. And I will spend the rest of my time doing just that. So since then, as it always has been, it's about Calix and Bo. The Calix and Bo Shenerker Memorial Fund was started the day after I returned from, from, from Gutter. We've raised almost $300,000 for a youth scholarship, character development training. We've helped students get into college. We help students stay in college. And we've actually established a leadership and ethics speaker series modeled after this one for middle school kids to try to grab them on those important life lessons before peer pressure, hormones, all of that other sort of stuff. Social media gets really mean. We try to hit them with, with life lessons 
character development before they matriculate into high school. Because it's really important to do that. And where did I learn that? Right here at Fort Worth Country Day School. I learned it out in the field that's right outside the upper school. If any of you were here with Colonel Rosker <laughs> doing dirt drills, head in the hole, there was no grass. They were called dirt drills for a reason. <laughs> was dirt, dust, rocks, and stickers. Not the kind you put on a notebook. <laughs> kind that embed in your skin. We sponsor art competitions, we sponsor soccer tournaments, we sponsor, we've been to debate meets and everything else because we keep Calix and Bo alive. Because through all of the angst and the tears and the fears, we celebrate them because we remember them. You see, my children were normal kids living exceptional lives. The love and respect they had for each other, but more importantly, for all others, especially those different than them, had been forged from numerous times being the new kid in school. And that new kid in school could have been in Germany, could have been in Hawaii, it could have been all across the U.S. They always welcome new kids in their group. I remember Bo bringing these new boys over in school, a couple of them into his posse, just because he knew what it was like to be the new kid. Generous to a fault, Calix and Bo. My children were devoted friends, classmates and teammates, and had lived much richer lives than their 16 years and 13 years, respectively, on this, on this earth game and much richer lives than many people live after multiple decades. So, I'm often asked, you know, Parker, how do you do it? How do you get up in the morning? How do you put one foot in front of the other? And how do you do it with such positivity? My answer is a promise. And here goes that swearing in public thing again. I refuse to let this tragedy change who I am. Can you evade the slide, please? I will not wallow in anger or pity. I'm still a father, and fathers love their children forever and ever. Amen. Whoever said time heals all never met me. I'm not healed. It gets more painful every day, especially now as I see their friends graduating from high school, from college, getting married, on to grad school, doing these wonderful things. And my pity party lasts about that same split second that it took me to look in that colonel's eyes. And I'm over it, I'm happy for him, and probably shooting him off a note to tell him how proud I am. Counts and most friends allow me to stay involved in their lives. They still include me. I'm still going to football games, been to some football games, watch one of the most vicious hits I've ever seen in my life on a kickoff, Rice University, Corbett. I'm going to golf tournaments, I'm going to future business leaders of America conferences because while I may not have my children on earth with me, I have my kids, and they're pretty darn awesome. So let's transition a bit. So what will you do when you're knocked on your knees? What have you done when you've been knocked on your knees? Share those experiences with those who, who may not have some of, some of that background. You know, you just, if you're knocked on your knees, you're just going to lay down and wait for the referee to count out that 10 count? Eight. Nine, ten. How about throwing in the towel? Seems like a good option. How about standing up and picking up that towel and wiping off the sweat and wiping away the tears and living and living out loud? There's one thing you got to know about the Shannon: we are loud. 
You can allow hate to take over and be completely consumed by anger and resentment. And I don't think anybody would fault you. I don't think anybody would have faulted me had I done that. In fact, you have every right to be that way. Or you can, you can do as I do, and you can swear in public often, loudly, and proudly, and make a promise to yourself or someone else that you'll be grateful for what you had, and in most cases, what you still have. What was my choice? I think y'all know my choice. I live out loud. Well, let me start over. Hi, I'm Parker. I live out loud. I swear in public. And I choose an attitude of gratitude. I'm gonna leave you with I'm gonna leave you with a couple of things. This is from Emerson. What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Remember this when you feel you can't go on, when you feel the world closing in on you. What's behind you and what's before you, tiny matters compared to what you got here. It matters. Reach in and find that strength. We have a choice to make. And those whom we love and those who love us have choices as well. Me, I'll choose gratitude every single time. In closing, I hope that, uh, I hope that you, uh, you have a little different perspective on swearing now. Those of you who are parents, maybe you do let your kids swear every now and then and help them to do so. I encourage you to give, them, give it a try. It's definitely worth the effort. And I'll leave you with one parting thought. Everything changed for me. I lost my children. I lost my wife. I divorced. I moved. I retired, and I lived under intense scrutiny from the media and from others who wanted to judge how I lived my life and how I raised my children. All at the same time, I'm grieving for my children. Quitting, never an option. Thanks for this opportunity to be here. It's an ultimate honor for me to be here to talk about Chip. I hope I gave you a little bit of insight in Chip and who he is and who he is to me. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for this invitation. It's been, it's been really an honor for me and I'm looking forward to classrooms tomorrow. I, I work with an organization called Total Courage, and so I focus our efforts on middle school and high school kids. With Total Courage, we work with, student, with uh, college coaches and student athletes, helping them be better people, especially in the fishbowl of social media. It's a tough thing to do. But thank you so much for this honor. to take notes. Uh, I followed what the teacher told me to do. I won't repeat all of those, but I suspect we all walked away with some different notes. Because Parker, you give us a lot to think about. I particularly am grateful for meeting Garth and Emma through you. I'm grateful as I look at my notes for knowing Chip better. 
I knew him from across a soccer field. I was on the bench, he was playing. He was opposition for me, but I saw him at that point in time. But I know him better now, thanks to you. I obviously appreciate getting to know Calix and Bo. Thanks for introducing all of us to them. And most importantly, thanks for choosing gratitude over hate. It's an incredible model and we're all appreciative. Thanks for being here. Proud to call you a fellow Country Day alum. Thanks. <laughs>